All right, well, I have that it's noon. So welcome to the first event of the fifth annual Southeast Kansas Pride celebration. This year's theme is We're Coming Out. We had planned an exciting week of in-person events for us to celebrate. Right. Well, I have that it's noon. So welcome to the first event of the fifth annual Southeast Kansas One Pride celebration. This year's theme is We're Coming Out. We had planned an exciting week of Sorry about that. I'm uh, managing the um, technology side of this presentation as well as giving the presentation. But today is our first um, Southeast Kansas Pride celebration, or I'm sorry, the first event of our fifth annual Southeast Kansas Pride celebration. Um, our theme this year is we're coming out. We had planned to have um, our biggest Pride celebration yet. And while we're still able to do that this year, we have had to revise our schedule um, for our in-person events. Um, so just a few housekeeping things on our Pride celebration this week. Um, we have canceled our Thursday night social. Um, we have moved our Friday drag show from the Booth Hotel to the 4-H building at the park and have asked our headliner, uh, Dusty Ray Bottoms from season 10 of RuPaul's Drag Race to come at another date when COVID uh, is less of a threat in our community. Um, we have also changed our Saturday event. Um, from being an all day event to being from 5 to 8 p.m. at the band show at Riverside Park. Um, our drag show on Friday night starts at 7 p.m. And you can find all of our revised Pride plans at uh, projectqna.org. Um, our website is a little bit slow on loading, but once you get there under our work, you can find Southeast Kansas Pride. And that'll have the updated schedule for all of our events. But you all tuned in today for our Lunch and Learn workshop Pride from Stonewall to Small Towns, Kansas. So in order, in order to look at how we have gotten from Stonewall to Pride celebrations here in Small Town, Kansas, like Independence, um, we first got to start back all the way um, from when Kansas became a state um, so we'll, we'll look at from statehood to Stonewall. We'll talk about a Kansan named Alan L. Hart. Um, we'll talk about the uprising herd around the world. And then we'll move on to post Stonewall. Um, we'll talk about John Reed Sims and Gilbert Baker, both Kansans. Um, and then we get to talk about when pride came to Kansas. And we'll look at Stacey Lentz, Katie Sowers, and Sharice Davis. And when I first started to work on this presentation way back um, in the middle of the summer, um, I was just wanting to really talk about like how Stonewall had influenced Kansas and how Kansas has ties to pride celebrations and major accomplishments throughout the LGBTQ civil rights movement. Um, as I started doing my research before I got um, sidetracked by um, having to work with the planning committee to revamp pride to make it more COVID friendly, I started thinking about what exactly Kansas is. And yeah, Kansas is a state, but Kansas is its people. And the people of Kansas have this unique ability to band together and create change within their community. And so when I was working on this presentation, I thought it was really important to look at how events, not only in the state of Kansas, but around the country, influenced and um, changed these six individuals that we'll be talking about today. But before we can really get into the uprising around the world, we need to start back um, in 1861, January 29th to be exact, is when Kansas became a state. And by, by 1870, nearly 500,000 Americans had crossed the continental US to Western territories since the 1840s. Um, the kicker to that though, is just about 10% of these travelers, these 500,000 travelers, were women. So 10% of those were women. So it was the westward expansion was very uh, male dominated. So about 10 years out, or I'm sorry, about 30 years, 29 to 30 years after Kansas became a statehood, Alan L. Hart was born on October 4th, 1890 in Hall Summit, Kansas, which is in Coffee County. 10 days after Alan L. Hart was born, um, a man by the name of Dwight D. Eisenhower was born on October 14th. And so we will um, 
look at how different events throughout the, these two gentlemen's lives affected them. So Dwight D. Eisenhower was born in Albaline, um, just a couple hours north of, of uh, Coffee County. Um, in 1917, uh, Alan Hart had moved from Kansas, their hometown in Kansas, to Oregon, where they became um, a physician, a novelist, among other things. But in December, between December and January of 1917, over the winter break at the University of Oregon, Alan Hart go undergoes a hysterectomy. Uh, Alan was born a female, identified as a male um, all through their life, and in December of 1917, received a hysterectomy and lived their life um, fully as a man the rest of, of their existence. Um, the same year, they, in Har Harlem, on the opposite end of the country, the Harlem Renaissance began. And I bring this up because while they are not a Kansan um, officially, uh, this person was born in Joplin, Missouri, uh, Mr. Langston Hughes. Uh, many scholars say that the Harlem Renaissance was as gay as it was Black. And Langston Hughes was one of the um, crucial members of, of a crucial artist of the Renaissance period in Harlem, New York. Um, a few years later, in 1920, uh, the drug company Bayer releases the first synthetic hormone in which Alan Hart uh, begins taking. And uh, the following year, in June of, or June 10th, 1921, the Hall Summit newspaper uh, wrote an article about uh, Mr. Hart, and they stated, young Hart was different even then. Boys' clothes just felt natural. Hart always regarded himself as a boy and begged his family to cut his hair and let him wear trousers. Hart disliked dolls, but enjoyed playing doctor. He hated traditional girl tasks, performing farm work with the menfolk instead. The self the self-reliance that became a lifelong trait was evident early. Once, when he accidentally chopped off his fingertip with an axe, Hart dressed it himself, saying nothing about it to his family. Hart kind of is the typical Kansan. Doesn't want to um, cause a big to-do. They chopped off their finger when they were using an axe. They wrapped it up and went on about their day. But the key point here is in 1921, this newspaper article in a small town in Kansas that I believe does not exist anymore, or if it does, it's an unincorporated town, was able to use Alan's correct pronouns. This is 1921, a 100 years ago. So if they can use correct pronouns now, we should be able to do it as well. Um, a few years later in Chicago in 1924, the first LGBT uh, rights organization was founded by Henry Gerber. Uh, the Society for Human Rights was, um, was founded by this immigrant from Germany. However, the organization was short-lived because almost all of their members were arrested because at the time it was illegal to be gay. In 1925 in Topeka, the state Supreme Court in the case State versus Holbert held that fellatio, whether heterosexual or homosexual, violated the state sodomy statutes. This is all the way back in 1925. So Kansas has had a long history of uh, monitoring people's sex lives. In 1933, um, in Germany, while this is an international issue, um, between 1933 and 1945, nearly 100,000 German homosexual men were rounded up and sent to concentration camps along with um, Jewish individuals, uh, people with disabilities. Um, homosexuals were one of many um, people that the uh, Nazi Germany deemed unacceptable. Um, so there's about 100,000 uh, gay men that were sent to these concentration camps. Oftentimes they would be sent to work camps where they would have to uh, test out new souls for, their, for the German soldiers' uh, boots. So they would be required to run on all different terrains for hours on end without stopping mm. um, with the fear of being um, killed if they did stop. Um, so the, the, mm. the LGBTQ individuals that were in concentration camps were, had some of the most stringent, um, brutal torture um, work, working conditions. Um, and when and they were branded by a pink triangle. Um, the pink triangle has became a symbol for the LGBTQ community, and that stems from uh, 
gay men having to be branded by the pink triangle on their uniforms in concentration camps. I believe the, the um, take back of the pink triangle happened around the um, 60s and 70s. But that was in 1933, um, about a decade later during the liberation, um, the Allied forces came in and liberated all the concentration camps across Europe between 44 and 55. And during this liberation of the Nazi concentration camp, US, British, and Soviet uh, forces liberated everybody but the uh, gay men in those concentration camps. Because at the time, under paragraph 175 in Germany, it's criminal code, uh, homosexuality was still illegal. And in the um, US, Britain, and Soviet forces, they all still classified homosexuality as being illegal as well. So these men, if they did, were fortunate enough to survive the cruel torture in the concentration camps, once they were liberated, were then sent on to prisons to finish out their term. So back in the United States, just a few years later, in 1974, or 1947, uh, May 6th, actually, in 1947, uh, John Reed Sims was born in Smith Center, Kansas, another rural community. And it, Sorry, I went too, fat, too far. Um, in 1950, um, you, the US Congress issued a report entitled Employment of Homosexuals and Other, Perverted, Other Sex Perverts in Government. It's, dis it's distributed to the members of Congress after the federal government had covertly investigated employees' sexual orientation. This report states that since homosexuality is a mental illness, homosexuals constitute a security risk to the nation. This, is, this helped um, fuel the Lavender Scare in the McCarthy era. And in June, of, June 2nd of 1951, uh, just four years after uh, Mr. Sims was born, in Chinook, Kansas, Gilbert Baker was born to a, a father who was a judge and a mother who was a teacher. Two years later, um, if you remember, sorry, two years later, you remember our good friend Dwight D. Eisenhower? Um, in January of 1953, uh, Mr. Eisenhower becomes our president. And three months after that, on April 27th, 1953, Mr. Eisenhower issues an executive order 10450, which bans homosexuals from working for the federal government, stating they are a security risk. This order stays in place until 1993, when then President Bill Clinton and Congress enact the don't ask, don't tell policy. A few, about five years later, the US government makes another um, statement, um, this time through the Supreme Court. And in 1958, the Supreme Court issued a decision on the First Amendment, free speech protecting of publication, I'm sorry, um, the Supreme Court, heard, or without hearing oral arguments, made a decision stating that the First Amendment free speech rights protected the publishing of one magazine. Up until this point, the US Postal Service was able to open anybody's mail, see what was in it, if the, and then determined if it was obscene, lewd, or levacious. They also had the power to keep lists of who was receiving this material and list of homosexual men that received one magazine. One magazine at the time was the publication associated with the Mattachine Society, which was another LGBT, organi LGBT rights organization, early LGBT organization. The government stated that the Postal Service did not have the right to do this. And sadly, on June 1st, in 1962, Alan L. Hart passed away in Oregon at their home due to heart failure. But um, one positive thing is that that same year, Illinois becomes the first state to decriminalize homosexual acts between two consenting adults in private. So we're starting to see some change here. But this was in 1962, the same year that Alan Hart passed away. Pardon me.
So about this time, things are starting to pick up. And in 1966, in Kansas City, Missouri, we're just going to pretend like Kansas City, Missouri is part of Kansas. I think maybe our Missouri watchers might get a little angry about that. But in 1966, Kansas City, Missouri held the first meeting of organizations that would become MAKO, which was held the weekend of February 18th under the title of the National Planning Conference of Homeophile Organizations. 14 national organizations diverged on Kansas City for a weekend of planning what would be a big conference. Over the next six months, they had, um, the attendees of this conference set up legal defense funds and started a newsletter. Um, that same year, um, before Stonewall, um, in 1966, in the Tenderloin District of San Francisco, um, one, one late night, there was a cafeteria called Compton Cafeteria. And this uh, cafeteria was open 24 hours or at least most of the night. So it was a popular place among street kids, street workers, drag queens, the trans community. They would all gather and talk and it was a safe place for them at the time, despite the fact that management really wasn't excited that they would come in and stay all hours of the night and oftentimes only order coffee. However, one night um, in August of 66, um, management called the cops to come and bust up this group. And one of the drag queens, I believe at the time, um, took their coffee in, pitched it at the cop, starting a riot. This was the first um, riot of its kind against police brutality and harassment. And it went on a few nights following the initial incident. But the positive thing out of this was that the National Transsexual Counseling Unit, um, which supports transgendered people, was formed. So this was the first kind of time people had really gotten back and fought back against police brutality against homosexuals. Uh, three years later, following that event, on June 22nd was the uprising heard around the world. On June 27th, um, the Stonewall Inn was raided for a second time in one week. So to kind of understand this time, as you can see, being gay was not very popular and it was actually dangerous to be openly gay during this time because you could be risk, risk being arrested. On the other side of that, bars were not, were not allowed to serve LGBTQ individuals. So in New York City, one way they got around this was the mobs opened up gay bars, such as the Stonewall Inn, and they would pay off the cops. However, in order for the police to make it look like they weren't being paid off, they would go through and raid these gay bars occasionally. Well, the Stonewall Inn kept building its presence and getting bigger and bigger. And one week um, in June, they, the police raided the bar. The next day they opened back up. And at this time, the bars would water down their drinks and charge outrageous prices. So it's not like the bars we see today. But finally, on that Saturday night, June 27th, the police decided to, they were going to put a stop to the homosexuals meeting at the Stonewall Inn. So they decided to raid the bar again. And they were very forceful. But this time, the, the patrons of the Stonewall Inn, including Marsha P. Johnson and many others, were fed up. They were tired of being harassed. After all, we're all normal people. We just want to go out and have a drink ourselves with our friends. So when the police decided to raid the Stonewall Inn on the 27th, the queer people got fired up and fought back. Marsha P. Johnson is often credited with throwing the first shot glass against the window or brick. Um, the, the, the accounts of that night are not set in stone, so to speak, but there are some general um, consensus of what went on that night. And a really good book is called Stonewall. Um, I can't remember the author off the top of my head. Um, but if you type in Stonewall on, uh, on your local bookstore website, you should be able to find that um, pretty easily. But it's a great book that, that chronicles the entire uprising over the six nights. Um, more than 400 people attended the, the uprising throughout all of the, the demonstrations night after night. But this was the flashpoint for the LGBTQ community to rally around. That same year um, in Topeka, there was a comprehensive 
reform to our Kansas sodomy laws, which resulted in a penalty of six months in jail and or a fine of $1,000. So while in New York City, they were fighting for their rights to congregate, here in Kansas, we were just fighting for our rights. This revision in 1969 of the sodomy laws here in Kansas also legalized, it legalized heterosexual sodomy. Kansas was the first US state to do so. Um, so that's kind of what's going on here in Kansas while the Stonewall riots are still are, are raging in New York City. And that same year in New York City, the Gay Liberation Front was formed following the riots. So this organization came about from, and I, I apologize, I don't mean riots, I mean uprising. Um, this, the Stonewall uprising brought about the Gay Liberation Front, which was an organization that pulled all of these people together to help create change in, for the queer community. So we had the riots, we get this organization. What happens now? Um, I, I, I brought up the fact that John Reed Sims and Gilbert Baker were both from Kansas and we haven't heard much about them yet. They've been growing up and, and coming of age here still in Kansas. So all of this information still is still affecting them. Um, here's a picture of the, four, the original Stonewall sign and some of the uh, participants of the uprising. So the Stonewall riots come in and shake everything up. And in 1970, we have a new person um, here in Kansas. Her name is Stacy Lentz. She's born in Atchison. And um, we'll be talking about her later on in the, in the 90s and, and early 2000s. But, that same year that Stacy is born, Gilbert Baker, if you remember, remember them, they're from, they were born in Chinook and raised in Parson. They are, um, they have joined the army and they, in 1970, they are stationed in San Francisco as a medic. So they're helping take care of veterans that are coming back from uh, war and working in the hospitals in San Francisco for about two years. And then finally in 1972, uh, Gilbert is honorably discharged. If you read Gilbert Baker's uh, Rainbow Warrior, you get to find out how fascinating this person really was and, and, they, and why they joined the army and why they ended up becoming, um, working in the medical field. Um, there's a really great story about um, how courageous Gilbert Baker is and, and how much they stood up for themselves. Um, so I definitely recommend reading Gilbert's book. But they, they were stationed in San Francisco for about two years. And in 1972, the same year that uh, Gilbert is honorably discharged, uh, John Reed Sims moves to San Francisco. And Mr. Sims becomes a, a part-time uh, junior high teacher. Um, he, he's, he teaches band from time to time at a, at a local uh, junior high school there in San Francisco. But the real exciting time in the 70s was in 1975 when, once again, the Kansas City, Missouri side holds its first pride celebration. Um, a year later though, <clears throat> to, or, I'm sorry, <clears throat> that same year, uh, 1975, or three years later, sorry, one second, let me look at my notes here. I got sidetracked. I got really excited about Kansas City's pride in 1975. But in 1976, a year later, uh, Topeka, once again here in Kansas is, <clears throat> Um, trying to sort out everybody's sex life. So um, in 1976, uh, Topeka, or can the Kansas legislators proposed a bill to repeal the now only homosexual sodomy law. However, and it was approved in the House of Representatives by a vote of 21 to 19. However, when it went to the Senate, it failed to ever be considered. So back in 1976, there was a, a a push to um, get that law off the books. However, I believe it's still on the books today, even though it's not enforceable thanks to Supreme Court rulings in, in other cases. But fast forwarding to 1978, um, Gilbert Baker comes, Gilbert Baker and John Reed Sims both come back into play at the same Pride celebration in uh, San Francisco. Baker um, has created the first rainbow pride flag. And uh, their book, Rainbow Warrior, chronicles the um, story about how they came to design the flag. But uh, the original flag had eight colors. 
Um, it had hot pink, which was to represent sex. Red represented life. Orange was healing. Yellow, sunlight. Green was nature. Turquoise was magic or art. Indigo was serenity. And violet was spirit. And the, he made two ginormous flags that um, him and 30 volunteers raised the morning of June 25th for the San Francisco Pride Celebration. The same Pride Celebration um, featured another very prominent Kansan, which was uh, John Reed Sims had formed a group, which was the Gay Freedom Day Marching Band and Twirling Corp. And they first performed at the June 25th Pride in 1978, which made them the first openly gay musical group to ever publicly perform in the United States history. So these two people from Kansas, Gilbert Baker and John, Rims, John Reed Sims, started something that caught fire and took, took off all around the world. At any large city pride, you can see the uh, marching band and twirling corps uh, performing. Um, not necessarily the San Francisco, usually each city has its own, um, but the most iconic thing that you can think of when you think of the LGBTQ civil rights movement or LGBTQ rights and just LGBTQ in general, you think of the pride flag. And that was created by Gilbert Baker, who grew up in Parsons, Kansas, and was born in Chanute, Kansas. When you go to a large city gay pride celebration and you hear the marching band, that idea came from John Reed Sims, who was from Smith Center, Kansas. But John Reed Sims did not just stop there with the Gay Freedom Day marching band and twirling court. John Reed Sims had another idea, and that was to start the first gay men's choir in San Francisco. And if you're familiar with anything with the LGBTQ community, almost every large city has its own, very own gay men's choir. But the idea came from John Reed Sims, a Kansas native. And they formed on October 30th, 1978, and they had their first performance just four months or four weeks later on November 27th, 1978. Um, for some of the history buffs in the audience, you might understand why this date's important. But on June, or I'm sorry, on November 27th of 1978, um, the Gay Men's Chorus had an impromptu unplanned debut on the steps of San Francisco City Hall for a memorial, an impromptu memorial for Supervisor Harvey Milk and Mayor George Moscone when they were murdered um, in 1978. So that was the first performance. But that Gay Men's Chorus, who has performed around the world, the San Francisco Gay Men's Chorus, was started by John Ray Reed Sims, which was from who was from Kansas. So as we move on um, to others, Pride is starting to come closer and closer to Kansas. But on May 22nd, in 19, 1980, um, we have a new person in the world, Cherise Davids was born um, in Frankfurt, West Germany. Um, her mother was um, served in the US Army. And we will talk about her um, later in this presentation. But four years later, um, on July 16, sadly, I'm sorry, July 19, July 16, 1948, there's a typo on my slide, but on night, July 16, 1948, uh, Mr. Sims passes away due to complications from AIDS, which at the time was a little known disease. Uh, just two years after his passing, um, in Katie Sowers was born on August 7th, 1986. So we're starting to get some younger people, um, some people closer to maybe some more of the younger viewers ages. Um, and it's really exciting because there's a lot of changes going on, not only nationally, but also here in Kansas as well. Um, but sadly, in 1989, um, in Topeka, the state versus Malkin, the state Supreme Court held that Kenilingus did not violate the state sodomy statute. The Kansas legislator acted quickly passing a law that following year that forb forbid oral genital stimulation between the tongue of 
a male in the genital area of the female. The law excluded lesbian relations, but reintroduced criminal penalties for certain homosexual conduct. And in 1992, the law was amended to include lesbian relations as well. So Kansas has had a very long history of trying to be involved in other people's sex life. But what was really, really exciting in 1990, Wichita held its first pride celebration. And there's a really great documentary. I believe it's still available on YouTube. If you type in Wichita, Kansas first pride, you should be able to find the documentary that chronicles the organizers of that first pride. And it's an excellent documentary if you haven't had a chance to watch it. Four years later, to commemorate the 25th anniversary of Stonewall Inn, our friend Gilbert Baker created the world, or at the time, the world's longest pride flag. And in their book, Rainbow Warrior, it chronicles the chaos of um, trying to plan for creating the world's longest flag. Um, Gilbert documents the, the, the chaotic, often chaotic times that can be planning pride celebrations. I know with our pride planning committee, it's, it's pretty crazy. I couldn't imagine the scale of a New York pride planning committee. But in Gilbert's Baker, Rainbow Warrior, they document all the chaos of changes and everything going on. But Gilbert was able to pull off this amazing feat of creating the world's longest flag, which happened to be the rainbow flag um, at the time. And that debuted for the 25th anniversary of the Stonewall Uprising. That same year, our, our fellow Kansan, Stacy Lentz, moves off to New York uh, to become a recruiter, building a very great career in the staffing and recruiting industry. So a lot happened in the 90s, and I'm still working on, on getting that research in the early 2000s, but it, we're going to talk a little bit more about Gilbert Baker. And in 2003, Gilbert Baker created, to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the rainbow flag that he created back in San Francisco, Baker creates a flag that, that reaches from the Gulf of Mexico all the way to the Atlantic Ocean um, down in Key West to commemorate the 25th anniversary. Um, three years later, up in New York City, um, Stacy becomes the co-owner of the Stonewall Inn. By this time, the Stonewall Inn had kind of um, taken a dive and became more of a, um, a, a not so great place that you'd really want to, to hang out at. And um, a group of investors, including Stacy, came on and, and revamped it. And now it's a wonderful place. Um, they have done some amazing work. They also celebrated the 50th anniversary in 2019 of the Stonewall Uprising, along with World Pride. So they've done some phenomenal things. And, and it's, it's a super historic place. If you, if you get a chance to go to New York and visit the Stonewall Inn, I highly recommend it. Um, and Stacy and her team have done wonderful jobs keeping that surviving. But uh, Stacy becomes uh, a co-owner of the Stonewall Inn, bringing Kansas back into that loop of um, the Stonewall Uprising. Um, four years after Stacy becomes the Stonewall Inn co-owner in Manhattan, Kansas, they hold their first pride, um, which they title Little Apple Pride. And I was fortunate enough to be going to school at K-State during this time. And I, I have fond memories of Triangle Park and seeing probably my first drag performance in the United States there. Um, so it was really exciting to see. And Manhattan's had a wonderful pride ever since. And tonight, uh, we actually have one of the organizers moderating our panel for the Small Town Pride panel um, tonight at 7 o'clock on Facebook. Um, so in 2016, um, Katie Sowers joins the Atlanta Falcons as an intern. And this really starts to propel um, Katie into the NFL. Um, but sadly, in 2007, on March 31st, Gilbert Baker passes away. This is about two months before they are scheduled to come back to Kansas, to Parsons, Kansas, actually, and be the uh, or headline the Gilbert Baker Film Fest Festival that was created in the honor of, of Mr. Baker. And um, sadly, they were not able to attend that. But the festival still goes on year after year. I believe they have another festival coming up this October. Be sure to check out their website to see all the details. It's a student um, film competition. Um, so check it out and um, support them. They're doing some amazing work to keep Gilbert Baker's name alive. It's very, um, it's very special to have someone as iconic as Mr. Baker 
from Southeast Kansas and, and somebody that created such an amazing piece of art and representation from Southeast Kansas. So give all the support you can to the Gilbert Baker Film Festival and Parsons as well. Um, so in, um, so now we still have three people left on the playing field, Stacey Lentz, Sharice Davids, and Katie Sowers. Um, in 2017, Sowers becomes the first openly gay NFL coach when she signs with the San Francisco 49ers as part of the Bill Walsh Diversity Coaching Fellowship. Um, like I said, she becomes the first gay NFL coach as well as the first woman NFL coach. That same year, Stacey Lentz, Lentz founded the Stonewall and Gives Back Initiative. This organization is to help fuel the momentum of the Stonewall Uprising and help create change in parts of the world that are slow towards change for the LGBTQ or community. Um, SIGBI or the Stonewall and Gives Back Initiative was, um, has gave Project Q&A two uh, grants to help fund our Southeast Kansas Pride celebrations. And we're very fortunate enough and we're so thankful for the work that the Stonewall and Gives Back Initiative um, does and the work that Stacy does as well. So as we're coming up closer and closer to 2021, um, that, um, in 2017, how can I forget this? We launched our first Southeast Kansas Pride celebration and Project Q&A launched in 2016, a year earlier than that. So in 2017, we had uh, the first ever Southeast Kansas Pride and five years later, we're celebrating the fifth annual one. Let's see. So going on to 2019, um, in January, on January 3rd, Sharice Davids becomes the first openly LGBTQ Native American elected to Congress. She's from Kansas and I believe in the um, Johnson County District. So she is the first LGBTQ Native American ever elected to Congress, which is amazing coming from Kansas and, and seeing how oftentimes slow, to, slow towards change we can be in Kansas. That uh, same year, Sowers becomes the first female and the first openly gay coach to win a Super Bowl. I don't think a lot of people here in Kansas were excited about that, but it's still a, a huge glass shattering, um, a glass ceiling shattering moment as well. And then in 2021, this past year, Sowers has moved to Kansas City to be a coach at the Kansas City Chiefs for the Kansas City Chiefs. So I know that'll make a lot of people happy here. Um, and two really exciting new pride celebrations around Kansas came on board. The first one in Deerfield, Kansas with Playcella, which is an LGBTQ arts festival out in Western Kansas. And the amazing thing about this festival is that it's in a town of 700 people. Uh, the founder of Playcella will be with us tonight along with the next um, organization that uh, hosted Emporia's first pride in this year as well. So tonight at our pride panel, small town pride panel discussion, we will have um, the founder of Playcella, the, um, a member from the Emporia group that both held their first prides this year, and then um, a member from Independence's Pride Planning Committee. Uh, and our moderator tonight will be a member of the Little Apple Pride Planning Committee. Well, I hope you enjoyed an overview of how international and national uh, issues have affected people in Kansas and how we have grown and how people have broken down barriers for others. Here you'll see a, um, some famous LGBTQ Kansans. There are so many um, queer individuals from Kansas that have not felt that they can stay here in Kansas and have moved away, as you'll see with like Gilbert Baker and John Reed Sims and some of those. Our job with Project Q&A is to make rural communities a more accepting and more tolerable place for all of us to live and to be able to live safely and openly. And there are so many amazing people, not just these famous individuals or the six individuals I talked about today, but so many people around the, the state doing wonderful work to make it better for LGBTQ individuals. Um, whether it's going back to the fight for marriage equality or the fight for trans kids to play sports in, um, in 2021, there are some amazing individuals that um, have these unique Kansas values that um, we all grew up with that are working to change our state to make it an inclusive state for all. 
I hope you enjoyed our presentation of um, Pride from Stonewall to Small Towns, Kansas. This is an ongoing research project of mine, so hopefully I'll be able to bring it back with some more information on all of the other Pride celebrations throughout the state that I know I left off, and my apologies to those hardworking individuals who year after year continue to organize such as Salt City Pride up in Hutchison or Wichita Pride. Um, I apologize that I, I, I might have left some of those off. But like I said, this is a work in progress. If you have any, if you'd like to contribute any information, I would love to have it. You can email me at Brandon, B-R-A-N-D-O-N, at projectqna.org. Um, at this time, I will look on the chat to see if we have any um, questions. And if you are I'm about to leave us, I will also be putting a, a link in the chat for um, a survey where you're trying to get as much feedback this year for Pride for grant purposes, as well as our own planning purposes. But I will see what questions we have now. It doesn't look like we have any, so without any more questions, um, I will... Um, I'd like to thank you all for coming and um, be sure to check out our new website, projectqna.org. Um, you can find all the information about our revised Pride schedule. Like I said, our Thursday night social is canceled. Our drag show is now moved to seven o'clock at the 4-H building and our Pride in the Park on Saturday is now moved to the band shell from five to eight. Thank you all for, for joining us and I look forward to seeing you tonight at our small town Pride or tomorrow at our uh, next Lunch and Learn workshop. Thank you.